I am Katie Culver and we're here with a Media Law Chat. I am delighted to, to uh, welcome another Media Law Geek. Amy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us where you're from and what top case we're going to be talking about today. Absolutely. So my name is Amy Kristen Sanders. I am um, an associate professor in the School of Journalism at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the notorious Pentagon Papers case uh, or New York Times versus United States. <laughs> Everybody calls it Pentagon Papers. Okay, so why have you picked this as, a, as your top case? Uh, so to me, this is one of the real landmark cases. Uh, and it has a really unique history. Unlike a lot of our other cases, uh, the Pentagon Papers case from start to finish was decided in just under two weeks. And for anybody who studied media law or law in general, they know that it's really unusual for a case not only to get to the Supreme Court, just in general, but to make it through the Supreme Court and be decided in about 15 days. I know. I certainly, I certainly can't think of another one. <laughs> and and it and it comes out in the comes out in the dissents, right? That the, the the warp speed. So what? So why were we at warp speed? Why did it move that quickly? Absolutely. So at the core of the Pentagon Papers are the Pentagon Papers, which is essentially um, a secret government study that the Secretary of Defense uh, had commissioned about the United States involvement in the Vietnam conflict. Uh, and these papers were about 7,000 pages uh, in length. Uh, they had been labeled as classified, and there were only a few number of copies that had been made. This was certainly not a public document. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the government contractors who was involved in the drafting of this study, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, decided that there was some pretty damning information contained in this and that the public needed to know what the government had been doing uh, in regard to its involvement in Vietnam. And so in early 1971, Ellsberg photocopied, if you can imagine standing at a copy machine, page by page and turning over uh, all these papers, photocopied um, the documents and approached members of Congress uh, with his concerns. The members of Congress he approached took no action, so he decided to give them to Neil Sheehan, who was a reporter at the New York Times. The New York Times uh, spent quite a while studying these papers, looking over them, uh, and in June of 1971, on June 13th actually, the New York Times began to publish front page articles uh, detailing the most, I think, damning information, including that Kennedy's administration uh, had helped overthrow and assassinate the South Vietnamese leader. So of course the New York Times publishes this, they get three stories out over three days uh, when the Nixon administration goes to court to seek a temporary injunction. You know, I think I think that's something that is is kind of gets lost in this case that Ellsberg didn't go first to the news media. It, it's something that you know, even like people who argue that the things should remain confidential, that he violated his classification obligations. You know, he he tried to go to his representatives first. I, I think that's, that's something that gets lost to the his, to history here. Absolutely, and you know, we see a lot of modern comparisons either to. Uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, or to Edward Snowden and the documents that he released. Um, and this is a really similar situation. But he, to me, the desire to approach Congress really indicates to me that Ellsberg was acting in good faith, mm -hmm. right? So the Nixon administration, of course, goes to court, they get their temporary restraining order. Uh, meanwhile, while the case is proceeding against the New York Times, the Washington Post is also in court. Um, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals affirms uh, the restraining order, and the Times makes an emergency appeal to the Supreme Court. Now again, that's extremely rare. We're talking about the case being her, uh, the story is being published on June 13th, the emergency appeal being filed on June 25th, 
and the court hearing the case the very next day. Mm -hmm. And like you, I can think of, of no instance that easily springs to mind where this has happened. No. Uh, so you have uh, esteemed Yale law professor Alexander Bickel, First Amendment hero to many, uh, who argues for the Times. The interesting thing about Bickel is he was no stranger to the Supreme Court. So Bickel had clerked for Felix Frankfurter. Uh, and interestingly, was a Supreme Court clerk when another landmark case, Brown versus Board of Education, was heard. So he knows his stuff. So the, the Supreme Court hears the case on the 26th of June. Normally then we would hear, um, you know, the court would have significant conference deliberations. It would take months before the court would issue an opinion. Uh, but in this case, they issued it four days later, on June 30th. And to me, one of the most interesting things about the case is how the opinion sort of unfolds, how it plays out. Because again, you have a per curiam opinion, which we don't see often, mm -hmm. right? We have this unsigned opinion of the court uh, with a six to, six to three decision uh, dissolving the restraining order right and allowing the times to continue publication but it seems interesting to me that in such an important case we have an unsigned opinion right and in part that's because the justices can't really agree on the reasoning right the the lead opinion the per curiam opinion says essentially um any time there is a government prior restraint. Anytime the government wants to prevent the publication mm -hmm. of information, there's a heavy presumption against constitutional validity, right? So the, the deck is already stacked against the government because of the First Amendment. Um, and that the government then has to justify why this prior restraint would be necessary. Now, all six of them agreed that the government hadn't met the burden to mm -hmm. justify the restraint in this case, but they go in myriad different directions as to why they sided with the government. And that's my favorite part. It, it's, it's a fascinating case to try to boil down for students, to get to a readable version for students, <laughs> because there's just so much going on. The reasoning is all over the map. Absolutely. So, um, of course, you have Justice Black, the ardent First Amendment absolutist on the court. Uh, and he says, essentially, there's never a situation where a prior restraint would be constitutional under his reading of the First Amendment, right? Uh, you have Justice Douglas, who typically agrees with Justice Black, and essentially goes further and says that the Espionage Act should never have played a role in this particular case. Um, and then you have the more moderates, right, mm -hmm. who, who side with the New York Times. Um, and essentially, you have White, Brennan. Um, Brennan proposes sort of using the clear and present danger test, says that's, you know, not really applicable uh, when there are nonspecific claims of harm to national security. Uh, and then you have Stewart and Potter Stewart and Thurgood Marshall. And to me, the most eloquent part of the opinion comes from Potter Stewart, right? And this is, I think, the quote that all of us who love the First Amendment, who are ardent supporters of democracy, cling to. And he says, in the absence of the governmental checks and balances present in other areas of our national life, the only effective restraint upon executive policy and power in the areas of national defense and international affairs may lie in an enlightened citizenry, in an informed and critical public opinion, which alone can here protect the values of a democratic government. That just gives me tingles. I know, I call it, I call it the money quote of, of Pentagon Papers. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think particularly today, we can see that tension between the court's desire to uphold traditional democratic values 
and to balance that with the powers given to the executive. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that balance of power, um, the, the respect for the separation of powers is an extremely difficult decision for the court to make. It's an, it's an extremely difficult balance for the court to strike. Um, and then, of course, like you said, you have the dissenters who basically sound like curmudgeons, <laughs> right? I just imagine them sitting around with their arms folded, pouting, and saying, well, we can't make a decision this fast. We need more time. And that's essentially the crux of those dissents, mm -hmm. right? Is that this is a really important legal issue. Um, and to be fully resolved, they need to deliberate it about it at a longer length. Yeah. And that, and that should the Nixon administration be given more of an opportunity to articulate the, the national security threats that, you know, did they have sufficient time? Of course, we know now that the threats that they argued never, never really did come to pass, um, which is such a, it's just such a fascinating element of any time we're dealing with the national security claims that, you know, you, it's very, very easy cudgel for for the government to pick up and sort of swing and say, you know, well, this is going to damage national security. Well, how do we show that? Um, we don't, we don't, we don't get into the business often of going back and assessing those impacts. Absolutely, um, and and you know, of course, the other interesting part of the of the Pentagon Papers is all of the events that play out afterwards. Mm -hmm. Right, um, because of course, after the Supreme Court's verdict, uh, the Nixon administration in, uh, has Ellsberg and his accomplice, Anthony Russo, indicted um, for espionage and stealing government property. Uh, the trial actually starts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the prosecutors have to dismiss the charges because all of a sudden Watergate happens, right? And we discover that. Uh, the Nixon administration has sent a team, the notorious plumbers, right, into Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to dig up this, you know, information that they're going to try to use to discredit him. It is an, it, that element has just always fascinated me, just the, just the boldness of it. <laughs> um, another thing that really fascinates me, though, is the way that Pentagon Papers sort of cements um, near near v Minnesota and prior restraint, which was a very you know a five four decision, but you know within four decades we get this massive test of that precedent and and really adhering to it as a precedent uh, where you know it had seemed kind of a you know in World War II near had seemed much more of a fraught kind of a precedent that it was it had seemed so close could it have swung the other way would we really be enshrining prior restraint as the mother of all first amendment evils um, but but it clearly pentagon papers does that absolutely and so so you know if you think back to near you have a, a you know sort of 1930s decision that purports to say we prefer post-publication punishment. We can imagine these myriad situations in which prior restraint would be permissible. And to me, you know, Pentagon paper sort of turns that on its face because it, it essentially rules out prior restraints in non-national security contexts. Mm -hmm. It gets rid of all of that superfluous language from near that suggests that there might be these myriad other times. And it really creates this, this difficult burden for the government to overcome that's nearly impossible mm -hmm. um, for, the, for the government to prove in court. Again, because as you point out, um, you know, how do we prove with any degree of certainty future harm? Exactly. Exactly. What do you think gets most misunderstood about this case? What do people get wrong about it? Well, I think a lot of people get wrong that they believe the court in no uncertain terms ruled out prior restraint in the United States. That's certainly not the case, right? There, there was no unambiguous language that suggested that prior restraints are always unconstitutional. Um, and I think that that is probably the most common 
misunderstanding of the case. I think a lot of people also um, see the per curiam opinion and they think that for some reason that carries more weight, yeah. <laughs> right? It's not a unanimous opinion. Mm -hmm. It's six to three. And, and quite frankly, the per curiam opinion itself doesn't give us a lot to stand on. Right. Right. Uh, Which brings us to the question of, you know, if this, if this were to come today with today's court, I think it just could be a fascinating outcome. It could be another case where you have sort of the, the, the strange bedfellows of First Amendment jurisprudence in the Supreme Court. Um, but I think there are also a lot of questions about deference to the executive and what that would look like now. What, what do you think of that? I don't want to see this case come before the Supreme Court. Right? <laughs> um, because I do think there are um, serious questions about how this court would defer to the executive. And I think that um, it's not a guarantee that this court would, would uphold uh, the Pentagon Papers standard. And I think that, you know, subsequent to the Pentagon Papers, we've seen the expansion of the use of this na national security justification in so many arenas. Mm -hmm. including for domestic surveillance. Yep. And it just worries me to think what the government would claim to be a national security interest in 2020 um, and whether or not the public and the court would view that as a legitimate claim. Yeah, it, it is particularly interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to see the, the, the few cases that are coming down in the next few weeks, but, but immigration being one area where national security is coming up that I probably wouldn't have predicted five years ago. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's, and, and where that deference to the executive in that context has been so palpable. So, well, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Amy. This is, this is a great, it's a great case. Uh, it's one that I think uh, it's, it's hard to follow that roadmap through all of the different um, uh, different reasoning here, but it's certainly something that that uh, is is important in our national history and important precedentially. And part of the reason it's a great case is because it has spurred so much popular culture <laughs> around the case, right? I mean, if you think about the Post in 2017, mm -hmm. uh, if you think about the Most Dangerous Man uh, in America, the documentary from 2009. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my favorite, personally, is the 2003 version called The Pentagon Papers with James Spader and yes. Daniel Ellsberg, right? So it has kind of a legend and a lore. And I, also, I really love Ellsberg's book, Ellsberg's book, Papers on the War. That's a great book. Absolutely. Yeah. It's been a pleasure, Katie. Thank you so much All for right. having me. Have, have a great day, Amy, and thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.